use brute force. And um, for the average person as well, it was a, a lesson as to how do you identify a real villain because most people are somewhat innocent in their understanding of evil and they think of it as something unknown of the ghoulish world it partakes in the supernatural when something becomes very powerful and can affect large you know encompassing things so the first picture we have is that's just a, a picture of Venice and uh, I think it's important that there's an overview of what Venice uh, is since Schiller did not just pick this as the uh, the environment for the story by uh, by by chance. Venice, um, for all of its influence, wealth, and power, was contained on a small little island in the lagoons and marshes of the northern Adriatic Sea. It was founded around 700 A.D. and Venice never had a strong naval or military defense. Uh, rather, their biggest defense was that they were in the middle of a swamp, but also that they were very adept in the art of espionage. They were the center for the highest level of intel intelligence gathering within Europe. Um, and we'll go into this in further detail uh, in a little bit. Um, they were basically a center for manipulating foreign policy throughout all of Europe and, and past Europe. Uh, in addition, Venice had a very powerful banking center, and uh, the bankers, the Venetian bankers, uh, called Lombards, uh, made a lot of money off of usurious loans that they were giving to people throughout Europe. Uh, one of these uh, was Edward III. They would give these loans uh, at a 120 to 180 percent interest, and uh, Edward III um, was especially uh, King Edward III of England was borrowing a lot of money from these Venetian bankers because he was convinced that he needed to have this large war with uh, the French primarily, but this is what led to the Hundred Years' War. But these loans were so extravagantly priced that in 1343 he could not uh, repudiate the war debts even though this is still at the beginning, sort of, of the Hundred Years' War. He couldn't pay it off, and it caused uh, one of the largest, or the largest, financial crash in, uh, in European history in 1345, which is what allowed for the plague to kind of sweep in Europe during that time, because everything shut down, stores, uh, you know, like hygiene was very poor, and that's when the plague was able to spread very quickly because of this uh, economic collapse. If you, some of these pictures, like the black and whites, it's just to give you an idea of what Venice looks like. Um, so Venice as a city was very, very secretive. Um, they had a very strong um, influence with the papacy. And uh, it was very common for, you know, people to just hire spies to spy on, on other people. Um, you had to be very careful with how you spoke in public anytime you were out uh, and about. And um, what would I say? It was, you know how these Venetian parties where people wear masks and all this sort of thing? It was kind of popular for people to go out to parties wearing masks and for your identity to be hidden so that nobody could report on you, but also that, you know, nobody would know necessarily some of the uh, uh, seedy things that you decided to do that night. Um, so it was a very, very secretive city. Uh, if you look at the, um, the color picture of Basilica of St. Mark, this is where the oligarchical families in Venice, uh, who became very uh, rich off of this usurious uh, lending to, um, to people throughout Europe, they stored their fortune in the Basilica of St. Mark. It's called the Fondo, and it functioned as the Venetian state treasury. It would absorb family fortunes of nobles who died without heirs as well. So if you didn't have someone to pass down, there was no arguing about it. It would go into the, the Venetian kind of oligarchical family fondo. And it was frequent in Venice that nobles would die under mysterious circumstances, um, or they would be assumed dead, the body never found. The body never found because if you go down, the canals of Venice were notorious for bodies being dumped in. 
um, and the water was really murky, so, um, you know, these bodies wouldn't be discovered for days later, they'd be unrecognizable, or sometimes they would never emerge. And uh, the gondoliers of um, these canals were also almost all uh, agents, like spies for the, uh, the Venetian political state. Um, of course, you have warring factions within this, so it's not like they're all hired by the same person, but there's, there's just everything is, is just about uh, secrets and intelligence gathering. So the best way to understand Venice was that its power was centered, centered in pitting their enemies against each other. Venice had developed such a reputation for this that by 1508, there would be an agreement between France, Spain, Germany, the Papacy, Milan, Florence, Savoy, Mantua, Ferrara, and others to form a league to dismember Venice, because Venice, now it became known that they, they were meddling with foreign policy, and we'll get into the details of how they were doing that in a little bit. So this league to dismember them was called the League of Cambrai. Unfortunately, Venice was conniving enough to corrupt certain members of this league with promises of wealth and influence, and the league, uh, just as it had the fate of Venice in its hands, um, turned on each other and Venice was able to get out of it by the, the skin of their teeth. Um, so before I go further in telling you the consequences of what Venice decided to do uh, after this very scary situation that they were, were in, um, I want to go into the Platonic and Aristotelian um, factions of school of thought. Um, it's very important for the theme of the ghost seer, um, which focuses on the outlook of the free thinker, which is connected to the spirituality um, faction, which I'll go into this. Um, but they're, they're basically Aristotelian base, these free thinkers. Uh, they hold the belief that reason lies in the methodology of logically based induction and deduction that the universe is a mechanism discoverable by a few simple laws. Free thinkers, which ultimately shaped the period known as the Enlightenment, emphasized individualism, skepticism, and science in the sense of, sense of empiricism and agnosticism. So, you know, for a lot of people, it seems kind of like, it sounds kind of uh, harmless, whether you're an Aristotelian or um, a Platonist, but we're going to go into how these ideas, they actually are um, definitive of like what camp you're going to be um, in this context of history. I'll, I'll go into it further. It's just a lot, I guess, to go through. Um, this school of thought, um, Aristotelianism, was a school in direct opposition to the Platonic school which characterized the Renaissance, and it was a cultural intellectual movement of Platonic humanism. So that was the first humanism to occur, was the Platonic humanism. And um, this study would revive the ancient uh, Greek and Roman thoughts. Um, it began its fruition in Italy, and its predecessors were people such as Dante and Petrarch. Um, Renaissance humanism, or Platonic humanism, set out to help humankind break free from the mental strictures imposed by religious orthodoxy, and to inspire instead free inquiry and criticism, and a new confidence in the possibilities of human thought and its potential creations. So if you look um, past this Platonic, or uh, uh, Raphael's uh, School of Athens, to the timeline, these types of timelines, which are overly uh, simplistic, but very prevalent in, in classrooms today, they misrepresent how ideas ultimately shape our past, uh, present, and future. Because an idea never just dies on a certain date, but rather can go through countless rebirths or is overlapping with uh, counter or oppositional ideas. Um, those who upheld the principles of the of Renaissance humanism or Platonic humanism didn't just all decide to become a free thinker, you know, in 17, 1750, where they write here that the Enlightenment started, um, or that everyone just became an Aristotelian humanist instead of a Platonic humanist. 
Um, and as we can see today, the fact that there is this differentiation of Platonic versus Aristotelian humanism, this has been two schools of thought that have opposed each other for centuries. And Florence to this day remains the base for the Platonic humanism and Venice the base of the Aristotelian humanism. Um, if you go to the next picture, this is a picture of the Padua University in Venice. Very beautiful looking, very impressive looking, but evil. <laughs> um, so during most of the 2,500 years, oligarchs um, have been identified by their support for the philosophical writings of Aristotle and their rejection of the epistemology of Plato. Aristotle asserted that slavery is a necessary institution because some are born to rule and others to be ruled. He also reduced the question of human knowledge to the crudest sense certainty and perception of facts. So in the midst of the 1300s, as I was telling you, there was that terrible banking collapse. Friends of Dante and Petrarch led out the basis for the Italian Golden Renaissance. Uh, this re reached its culmination in the mid-1400s under Nicholas of Cusa, Pope Pius II, and the Medici-sponsored Council of Florence. The Council of Florence being um, the attempt to reunite the Eastern and Western churches. Again, as you will see, the Platonic humanists always want to unite the people. The Aristotelian humanists want to divide people and have them always um, against each other. The Venetians fought the Renaissance with a policy of expansion on the Italian mainland uh, called terra firma, which brought them to the outskirts of Milan. The Venetians pro promoted the philosophy of Aristotle against pl the Platonism of the Florentines. The school of the Rialto was very famous and influential for, uh, as an Aristotelian academy, where Venetian patricians lectured and studied and where they popularized Ar Aristotelian humanism. The University of Padua, which you see here, became the center for European Aristotelian studies. So there's a very clear bias of like Venice being very much oriented towards Aristotelian and uh, Aristotelianism and Florence being towards uh, Platonism. So if you go now to your, go to your transcript, there's a quote by Pope Pius II. Does someone want to read it? Okay, I will read it. Uh, they wish to appear Christians before the world, but in reality they never think of God, and except for the state, which they do regard as a deity, they hold nothing sacred. So, this whole thing of, um, you know, the, the Venetians had quite a reputation, as you see here with Pope Pius II, um, even though they had such a stronghold with the papacy, um, it was understood by those who had any kind of insight and intelligence that they weren't really religious, um, even though they were at the center of religious reformation. Um, so Pope Pius II, who was Pope uh, in 1458 to 64, was an ally of Nicholas of Cusa, was a platonic humanist who helped organize the Council of Florence. One of the results of the Cambrai, Cambrai crisis, which is when all of the European heads had agreed to take down Venice because uh, they recognized that Venice was actually um, causing division, causing um, ongoing war, which was including the Hundred Years' War. The Venetians, they just barely escaped that, um, but they were seriously hurt by that as well, and they, they had lost a lot of money out of it and, and so forth. So this is going to be controversial, but the, the result of them surviving the Cambrai crisis was that they decided to organize um, a situation of Protestants against Catholics in order to divide Europe for centuries in religious war such that a combination like the League of Cambrai could never occur um, and assemble itself against Venice because if people are too divided, they cannot come together, recognize the enemy, and smote him. Um, so the Protestant um, 
Protestantism started under Martin Luther in Germany, right, around this time. However, uh, Venice's Cardinal Gasparo Contarini is really the leading figure of the Protestant Reformation. So Martin Luther was the one who came up with Protestantism, but you can kind of think of Martin Luther as, you know, these people in history like Lenin or so forth that have been manipulated, they've been selected, and they're, they're manipulated to uh, kind of feed a fire into a political and cultural situation. So it's really Gasparo Contarini that caused this pitting of Protestantism against Catholicism to the point where it led to the Thirty Years' War. So how did Contarini do that, and who is Contarini? Contarini was a pupil of the Padua school and Aristotelianism, and he really was the, the he's the, considered the first Protestant of Italy, and I'll, I'll explain why in a moment. He denied the immortality of the human soul, and uh, that he pioneered the Protestant doctrine, which was that it was salvation by faith alone, with no regard for your, the good works or charity. So that's already like quite uh, a, a change. You don't believe in the immortality of the soul anymore, and it doesn't even matter what you do on earth anymore. It's anything that you do, it's uh, considered part of the material domain, and you can only be saved by your personal relationship to God, your, your, your faith. But, but Protestants don't believe in the, the, they don't deny the immortality of the soul. No, he, yeah. He, this he, is a personal thing from him. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, apparent, this is like yeah. only recently discovered that Contarini actually played such a, a prominent role in all of this because he did not, he was technically a Catholic. So this is what makes it even more, if you guys have questions, uh, feel free to, to ask, but you can see how terrible this is that, you know, back in the day with Protestants against Catholics, you looked at them as another species of a person, like they were like dogs to, from the other side. So how controversial is this that the Catholic Cardinal Gasparo Contarini actually has been caught now in letters that were found in 1943 that he was the leading figure of the Protestant Reformation being a Catholic. Um, so in 1943, it was found in a monastery, um, it's the Camal de Lise Monastery of Monte Corona. The German scholar named Hubert Jedin discovered 30 letters from Gasparo Contarini. Uh, they were published in 1950 and they, they prove that he was the first Protestant, uh, the founder of the school in Italy. And, um, He's uh, responsible for uh, the crypto Protestants or spirituality. Do you guys have any questions? Are you following it? Feel free, feel free, because I, I definitely, you know, spend time thinking. One thing that I think is a good, uh, I guess, um, point that you're bringing up is that the, the free thinkers, people often think of them as simplistically being a rebellion from well, I haven't got absolute... into free thinkers yet, though. I, I, I haven't, I've been bringing okay, it up. Okay, I don't want to say anything yeah. then that you might end up talking about. So. But you guys understand okay. that, you know, the Thirty Years' War was the Protestants against the Catholics. You know, the whole Queen Elizabeth thing, Mary Scott's thing, like, it was just ongoing. Um, it, it, it was the, the main fueler for war at a certain point. You understand that Venice was Catholic. A lot of the uh, there were many Venetian cardinals, but they were involved in promoting the Protestant Reformation, which is what fueled the religious war. So it's basically catching them red-handed that they were organizing this whole thing to fuel it to such uh, a degree that it, it was in. Um, all right, who wants to read the this next one? Uh, this is Contarini um, speaking here. Yeah, sure. 
Uh, when uh, Contarini returned in 1525 from his mission uh, with Charles V in Germany, he told the Senate, quote, uh, The character and customs of the Germans are close to Firo. They are robust and courageous in war. They have little regard for death. They are suspicious but not fraudulent or malicious. They are not sublimely intelligent, but they apply themselves with so much determination and perseverance that they succeed as well in various manual crafts as they do in letters, in which many are now devoting themselves and make great profits. The forces of Germany, if they were unified, would be very great, but because of the divisions which exist among them, they are only small. So this is also uh, very important. So he's describing the Germans here, and he said, especially of the Germans, because, you know, during this time in Europe, you didn't have Italy as a whole country as it is now, or Germany as a whole country. They had, they had territories, like, you know, Florence and Venice were considered sort of a country back, back then. Um, under um, a larger umbra umbrella of, of, of Italy. Yeah, they're like little dukedoms. And yeah. Um, I guess kind of like how you can say Athens, you know, back in the day is part of Greece. And, you know, they're with Sparta more than with Persia, but they were still also separate. Um, so here Contarini very m much hones in that Germany especially needs to be kept divided. Otherwise, it's going to become a real threat. And if you look at Germany over, you know, from these 1500s until now, Germany has been very much targeted in foreign policy to cut it up continuously because it's always being seen as, a, as a, a large threat. And obviously this is a very important subject to Schiller because Schiller is a German. And of course he wants his people to be protected against this. If they had learned the lesson, you could argue they, they went to fall in for what happened in the, the 20th century. Um, so with this, um, the Venetians started to then really pump Luther, Lutheranism, which is the Protestantism under Martin Luther. They started to publish this and spread it all over Germany in order to perpetuate and exacerbate the divisions amongst the Catholics that were in Germany. Um, and as the counter-reformation advanced, which is the Catholic side, Contarini, who again is a, is a Catholic, but playing on the Protestant side as well, the, what he was able to do split into two wings. One of them was something that was more um, welcoming to Protestantism as Catholics, and they were called the Spirituali which later evolved into the Venetian oligarchy called the Giovanni, and they were the free thinkers. And on the other ring, wing were the Zelanti, who were oriented, uh, they were attached to the Spanish Inquisition-like stuff, and they were very much more heavy-handed in repression, um, and they evolved out of this older oligarchical party in Venice called the, the Vecchi, which were attached to the Vatican and the, the Catholic Habsburg dominions. But a Contarini kind of died before this division became uh, very pronounced. Um, so in 1536, Pope Paul III uh, commissioned Contarini to be a part of a very important document, uh, report called the Concilium de Amendende Ecclesia, and this was an, a report to uh, basically discuss the abuses of the Catholic Church. And amongst the other people you who... You mean a commission that produced a report? Yeah. yeah. What did I say? He, he's part of a report, but you mentioned oh. he's part of a commission. Yeah, yeah he's part a of a commission on investigation. Uh, to, to, to make this report. And uh, the other people who were part of this uh, commission, I don't expect anyone to know these people, Carafa, Sandoletto, Paul, Giberti, Cortez of San Giorgio Maggiore, um, they were all Venetian agents that were hired by the Pope, who was not a good Pope, because he also made a bunch of Venetians cardinal, cardinals during his time. He commissioned them to write this report on the abuses of the Catholic Church. This report ended up, well, we'll read the two quotes from this report, and you'll see it became an excuse for basically 
uh, forbidding certain books to be promoted. Um, mm -hmm. So who wants to read um, the, the third section? Yeah, read that. Uh, we think, Holy Father, that this has to be established before all other things. As Aristotle says in his politics, just as in any republic, so in the ecclesiastical governance of the, of the Church of Christ, this rule has to be observed before all others, that the laws have to be complied with as much as possible. For we do not think we are permitted to ex exempt ourselves from these laws, except for an urgent and necessary reason. So that's one quote, and it basically is just very much making it clear that Aristotle is going to be um, the guiding light in how they're going to reform the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. Aristotle is the chosen one by these Venetians, Venetian cardinals. Um, and it goes further. You want... yeah. And since they habitually read the colloquia of Erasmus to children in the schools, in which colloquia they're are many things which shape these uncultivated souls towards impiety. Therefore, the readings of these things and any others of the same type ought to be prohibited in literary classes. So Erasmus was the leading um, Platonic humanist at, during this period, and they're basically saying that he needs to be forbidden. <sighs> so um, Erasmus had like uh, um, interaction with Luther very early on, but Erasmus is uh, is Catholic, and he rejected what Luther uh, eventually formed as a as an idea because he saw that it kept people in the bondage of the will rather than the concept of free will, and um, you know the Venetians really wanted to convert Erasmus onto their side, and Pope Paul III even offered him. Uh, the position of cardinal, but he refused. So <clears throat> this report set the context for what would be the Index Librorum Prohibitorum, which is basically the index of forbidden books. And in this index, uh, which listed books that were forbidden by the Roman Catholic Church authority as dangerous to the faith or morals of Roman Catholics, they basically had a bunch of Platonists in this index of forbidden books, including Erasmus, Dante, um, all of Machiavelli's works were, were banned. I don't know how long they were banned for, but for a very long time. And um, what would I say to this? Well, just to mention, we're going to talk about Apollo, Apollo Sarpi, who kind of took um, a, the throne after Contarini died. And um, he was a leading um, influencer uh, amongst the Giovanni group. And they focused on France, Holland, Protestant Germany, and England, which were to be pitted against Milan, Naples, and the papacy. Um, the Ridotto Morissini, this is known as the kind of Venetian intelligence circle around the Giovanni. They were responsible for the um, coming about of the French Enlightenment, British empiricism, and what uh, resulted in the Thirty Years' War. Uh, can you repeat the Italian name of the intelligence group? Yeah, it's, uh, here, it's Ridotto Morissini. Um, so when you know, especially obviously the Thirty Years' War, that's obviously a bad one, but you know, it's interesting to think like why put so much work into um, pumping these, these um, philosophies. Um, so to get into, to give us a bit of an idea of what kind of person Sarpi is, there are two quotes by Sarpi that uh, someone, someone can read. Kristen, do you have a pen? I don't think so. Man was a creature of appetites, and these were insatiable. We are always acquiring happiness we have never acquired it and never will. Oh, sorry. 
Yeah, so before you go further on to the next one, this is very much like what uh, Plato talks about in the Gorgias dialogue where he's, he says, you know, because if you, if you measure pleasure as the, the, the greatest thing that you can be desiring and you go for, it's the greatest good, right? Which is very weird even for us to word it today as pleasure is the greatest good. And Socrates was making the point, but you're like a vessel that you are going into like, you know, honey or whatever kind of sustenance for the soul, you have a vessel that's full of holes and it's all just pouring out of your vessel and you're just consumed with constantly having to refill your vessel with this sustenance mm -hmm. rather than if you had a vessel that had no holes, you wouldn't have to stay by the riverside constantly <laughs> filling Sweet. it, right? Because someone who is, is governed by their desires to such a point that they're like obsessed, you become ruled by such desires. Instead of being above those desires, you're not in control. You're, 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 it's like the opposite of being free. Second quote. Uh, there are four modes of philosophizing. Uh, the first with reason alone, the second with sense alone, the third with reason and then sense, and the fourth beginning with sense and ending with reason. The first is the worst because form, because from it, because from it we know what we would like to be, not what is. The third is bad because we many times distort what is into and what we would like rather than adjusting what we would like to what is. The second is true but crude, permitting us to know little and, and, and that rather of things than of their causes. The fourth is the best we can have uh, in this miserable life. So he's saying that to start off with reason is the worst because we're starting off with what is our ideal. And if you start off with your ideal, like the ideal doesn't partake in reality, according to Sarpi. And so therefore, it's the most inaccurate one. And then... That's the, reason devoid of sensory uh, stimulation, right? Yeah, reason alone. Okay. Uh, then the third is the, uh, the second worst one, because you start with your reason and then you end with your, your sense. So, you know, you're starting off what you think is right and then you can like test it out to see if you can observe it to be true. Um, then the third best is to be ruled by sense alone, which is hard to even think of how someone could do that <laughs> without any thinking. And then the fourth is the best where we use our senses to uh, confirm to us what is true through reason. We're going to go into that more because Schiller actually completely attacks that way of thinking, which is reflective of the free thinker. Um, and we'll see what kind of real life consequences happen to a person who actually thinks that they can live their life in such a way. Um, so, yeah, this is the epistemology of the Giovanni, which is that the free thinkers, they're skeptics, they're full of contempt for men, as you can see here, you know. To, the best we can expect in this miserable life that we are always wanting happiness but we'll never acquire it like it's all it's not very uh, yeah you know optimistic so full of contempt for men and human reason and he Sarpy thought as the free thinkers did that man was the most imperfect of animals so quite a quite a placement for us um, Sarpi is the one in, with his intelligence circles which actually worked for the preconditions for the Thirty Years' War, which was the ultimate Protestant versus Catholic battle, not in Italy, but within Germany. And uh, they were responsible for the creation of the Protestant Union in 1608, and then within a year from then, a Catholic League was formed under the Aegis of Maximilian of Bavaria with Spanish support, and this set the context for a 30 years war. Um, who wants to read the, the next one? Uh, Henry, the Papal Nuncio in Paris report on March 3, 1609 to Pope Paul V on the activities of the Venetian ambassador 
Antonio Foscarini, a close associate of Sarp. From the first day that he came here, he has always compared himself in the same way. He most confident, he most confidential dealing are with the agents of various German Protestants, with the Dutch, with the English ambassador, and with two or three French Huguenots, Huguenots who can be considered his house guests. His business has been to attempt to impede in any way possible any peace or truce in Flanders. In addition to this fine project, he has been in a big rush in a big rush to set his to set up his leagues of protestant in Germany. And of although he has not been able to do much in this direction. In any case I am sure that if he can contribute to this, he will do it. Mm. Wow. So this is uh, someone from the Papal Nuncio that's reporting to Pope Paul V on the activities of the Venetian ambassador, Antonio Foscarini, who was uh, closely working with Sarpi to um, cause these two rifts within Germany such that the Thirty Years' War could occur. Mm -hmm. So it's actual it's just further proof that this was, was very much um, in a real way being organized by Venetians, always. Um, so, <clears throat> wow. Machiavelli um, was at the center of this fight to destroy Venice. He actually played a large role in helping organize the League of Cambrai. Um, he has been he has he's been slandered. I mean, he was also amongst the forbidden books. You know, he was always considered an enemy of Venice, and rightly so. Um, but he's received ill repute due to his writing of the Prince today. Um, but the thing is that people need to understand is that the Prince was written as a study of Venetian strategy. It's not to promote these strategies, and that this is what we have as an ideal, but you need to understand Venetian strategy, you need to have um, insight into evil so that you can recognize its manipulations amongst people. And sometimes, you know, you're caught in tough situations and, you know, it's not, it can't always be pretty either <laughs> because other people, they, they also get trapped into these things and then it puts you in a hard place and all this. But anyway, all to say is that Machiavelli wrote this all out and one of the Venetians, Paul, even said um, that he hated this book because he considered it uh, like who could be a friend to humanity and write down every way that you could um, manipulate politics and religion. However, this was a Venetian who is saying this about Machiavelli's book, who is in the middle of organizing Protestants against Catholics. So I think he was actually more upset with the fact that Machiavelli was exposing it. The Prince also was not meant to be published. It was meant for just the Prince um, uh, Lorenzo de' Medici as a, a kind of learning pamphlet. So it wasn't for the average person to know about this, because it's beyond the average person, you have to have a certain understanding of how foreign policy, intelligence, and espionage work for you to understand this, and it's a brutal world. Um, so Venice's greatest weapon is, uh, was, is in another form now, the ability to manipulate the perspective and motives of its targets. They don't engage in military warfare. They get other people to fight the wars against each other. They wage rather a mental warfare, um, which most are seriously under-equipped to defend themselves against. The Prince was thus written by Machiavelli as the study of the enemy's mind in order to defend the humanist base in Florence, which Venice was very much trying to destroy and luckily didn't succeed. It was written specifically for Lorenzo de' Medici, who had become the ruler of the Florentine Republic. Lorenzo was a very powerful and enthusiastic patron of the Renaissance culture of Italy. And just to give us an idea of this being Machiavelli's point, 
This is the last paragraph, the ending part of the prints. Uh, someone want to read it? I vote for Brigitte. It's here. This one can go here up to the here. Okay. Hey everybody. Okay. <laughs> this opportunity this opportunity must not therefore be allowed to pass so that Italy may at length find in her liberator. I cannot express the love with which I would be received in all those provinces which have suffered under these foreign invasions, with what thirst for vengeance, with what steadfast faith, with what love, with what grateful tears, what doors would be closed against him, what people would refuse him obedience, what envy could oppose him, what Italian would without allegiance, uh, withhold allegiance. This barbarous domination sings in the nostrils of everyone. May your illustrious house therefore assume this task with that courage and those hopes which are inspired by a just cause, so that under its banner our fatherland may be raised up, and under its auspices be verified that saying of Petra. Um, valor, valor against fell wrath will take up arms and be the combat quickly spread. Speed. Spread? Mm -hmm. For sure the ancient worth that in Italians steers the heart is not yet dead. So Machiavelli is saying that if a prince were to really understand these Venetian manipulations, he would be so powerful and so beloved, who could possibly resist him? And he ends with a quote by Petrarch, a very well-known platonic humanist, of uh, valor against fell wrath will take up arms. So something noble will succeed in this war, and the, the combat will quickly sped. For sure, the ancient worth, the study of the ancients, that in Italians stirs the heart, is not yet dead. Mm. <clears throat> All right, so um, the tragedy of wars such as the Thirty Years' War was very much on the mind of Schiller. And again, the Thirty Years' War, that mostly occurred in Germany, and it, it reduced its population by 50%. 50%. 50%. Half, half, half the population died in the Thirty Years' War in Germany. Um, so, yeah, it was, hi. it was very much an ugly thing meant specifically for Germans, but it was also to pit the churches against each other, to pit the Italians against the Germans and so forth, because if the Italians and Germans especially were to unite under this idea of uh, you know, the better humanism, um, they would be a, a great enemy to Venice. So Schiller was very bothered by this because the people who were pitted, the Protestant versus Catholic, was brother being pitted against brother. And they came to hate each other so much, they allowed themselves to be so completely manipulated, they were fooled into believing an absurdity that their friend was a foe. Their true foe was Venice, and they were tricked into killing each other. Most wars are the result of such methods. Most wars are the result of such methods. And therefore, Schiller thought it the utmost importance that the people, but most especially its leaders, come to understand the mind of such villainy, such as Venice, that once recognized and exposed for what it truly is, it lose much of its influence, and good people would no longer be manipulated by such machinations. With this in mind, we're now prepared to embark on Schiller's ghost seer tale. Um, you can think especially the first part of it as a sort of very long magic trick. And you need to keep your mind focused on what is really occurring rather than the flourish and distraction. Otherwise, you will mistake the deed for real magic when it was actually a series of sleight of hand trickery. 
Um, so that said, we'll start now by reading uh, parts of the ghost here. I think I'm doing okay for time. Um, so the ghost here, again, it's set in the 1700s in Venice. You have a prince who's actually, he's a German prince. He's staying in Venice for just a little while. I should, you know, I think he's planning on leaving within a week. And his friend, Count O, we're not given full names in the story because it's all very secret. Um, Count O is the one narrating um, this story um, so that he is narrating this from a point that he already knows what happens at this point. Um, the German prince was staying in Venice incognito, which was normal. A lot of people stayed in incognito, so it wasn't known that he was a German prince. Um, he kept his distance from diversions and resisted uh, the enticements of this city of temptation, because Venice really was a city of sin. Um, he was the third prince of the house, which meant that there were two people ahead of him before he would ever become king of his German domain. So he didn't really have an idea that he would ever rule one day, and so he kind of lived his life, um, you know, in isolation. He liked to read a lot, but as we're going to see, he didn't really have a structure in how he organized his, his thoughts. He's a Protestant by birth, Albeit his convictions were not the result of inquiries, these he had never made. Um, who wants to read the first part of uh, the book, which is the count basically just describing the prince as a person, which are important clues for us. Can we? Yeah. In book one, for those informed about a certain political matter, it will provide some welcome information. If these Page find them still among the living, and for others who lack this key, it will perhaps be an important contribution to the story of deception and adoration of the human spirit. One will be astounded at the boldness of the end which Abel is capable of designing and pursuing. One will be amazed at the peculiarity of oh, the... Boldness of the... Oh, right, no, no, you're right, okay. sorry. Okay. One will be amazed at the peculiarity of means. It is capable of summoning mm -hmm. to assert itself of these ends. Pure strip truth shall guide my pen. For when these pages enter the world, I will no longer be and will have neither anything to lose nor to gain on account of the report I make. Amid a clamorous crowd, he finds his way alone. He's so now he's talking about the prince. Okay. Shut off. Shut off in the world of his imagination, he was often a stranger in the real ones. There was never one more born to be ruled than he, although he was no weak. He was nonetheless intrepid and reliable. As soon as he had been won over and was equ equally disposed to do battle against an acknowledgeable, not acknowledge, prejudice, or to die for other one. His ambitions has never been awakened, and so his passions have taken other directions. Content not to be this dependent upon a will other than his own. He felt no temptation to rule over others. The quiet freedom of private life <coughs> and enjoyment of a li lively inte intellectual company were the utmost of his desires. He read a good deal, but without being selected, all of the knowledge he accumulated later only increased to the confusion of his conception because they had no, not been 
build on firm foundations. So it gives you just an idea of how the prince is at the beginning of the story, and you can see already that he's got some problems. Um, so as the count and the prince are, are out one night in Venice, there is this man that they notice starts to follow them everywhere. And um, the prince is a bit worried. He's like to the count, did you have some relationship with a woman like that was taken? Because, you know, they take this kind of stuff seriously in Venice. And the count's like, no, I mean, I have no idea why this guy's following us. And so the prince like, maybe he's mistaken, mistaken us for someone else. And they sit at a bench and they're about to leave. And they say, let's go to this place for nine o'clock. We have a meeting. And the Armenian says, who sits next to him at the bench, he died at nine o'clock, your cousin. So this is the, f the first one on, on the throne. So there was an old king of this German territory and the cousin, uh, the prince's cousin was the next one in line, but he died at nine o'clock, but it hasn't even been nine o'clock yet. It's like something like 10 minutes to nine or something. And the Armenian says he died at nine o'clock. <laughs> um, so the prince is like, okay, that's like creepy. And uh, they, you know, rush home and they, they um, you know, the prince wants to go the next day to see if he can find this Armenian. He's already, um, like, very interested in it. And within a week, a uh, week's time, a messenger confirms to the prince that his cousin did indeed die at 9 o'clock that evening. So the mystery uh, starts. And... Um, at this point, when the death has been confirmed, um, the, uh, the Armenian somehow finds the prince again in the crowd, and he says, there's members of the Senate, the Venetian Senate, who want to talk to you in this meeting. Where the count isn't invited to it, so we don't know the details, but when he returns from this meeting, he says something that um, is very much partaking of foreshadowing, I don't know who wants to to read it. One can be the prince, one can be Hamlet. Oh, I could be one of the characters. Okay, you be the, the prince. Say the other. You'll be Count O? Okay, so you start, Matt. Okay. Uh, Count. Just, just read it. it. Yeah, just yeah. read the whole thing. Count, the prince said in the words of Hamlet, there are more things in heaven and on earth than we dream of in our philosophies. Most gracious prince, Count replied, you seem to forget that you go to bed the richer of a great hope. The deceased had been crowned prince, the only son of the governing, um, who was old and sick, now without hope that his son would succeed him. An uncle of our prince, also without pro progeny or prospects of obtaining any, was all that stood between the prince and the throne. Do not remind do, me. Do, uh, no, that's me. I'm sorry. Do not remind me. And even if a crown were now mine to be won, I should now have more to do than think about this trivial matter. If it were really this, uh, sorry, if it were really that this Armenian did not merely guess that. How is that possible? Count interrupted. I would exchange all my princely hopes with you for a monk's cowl. So. Um, the prince already at this early stage has developed an obsession with how the Armenian made his mysterious prediction. And um, he has referred to his own possible ascension to the throne as a trivial matter, matter because he's now second in line to the throne, but he refers to it as trivial. What's extra interesting is that the prince kind of, you know, uh, ironically um, quotes Hamlet there are more things in heaven and on earth than we dream of in our philosophies. And what was the tragedy of Hamlet? Well, Hamlet became obsessed with a ghost, with chasing a ghost. He put the importance of this ghost above everything else. Hamlet didn't think of his role as a better king that was needed to end the mayhem and ensure the security of Denmark. When Hamlet discovers that his uncle was guilty of the crime of murdering his father, he continues in inaction. He's doesn't act. By the end of the play, Hamlet has never made any real decision or action in order to determine his own fate, let alone the people of Denmark. He lived more in his head than in reality. Um, he does not end with killing, he does end with killing his uncle, but only after 
every other possible avenue of action is already destroyed. He kills his uncle when there's, uh, and there's no one left to govern and the people of Denmark are lost. So interesting that the prince, or more like Schiller, has put these words of Hamlet into the, the, the mouth of the prince. So the prince very evidently does not wish this responsibility to rule. He's never prepared himself for this role, thinking it would never be his. And he confesses he would rather be a monk, an isolated figure with no expectation, than a king. Um, so in this situation, it's, it's very eerie because, um, so what happens is the, the prince and the, the count are out another night, the, the prince is playing cards, and he gets into an argument with a Venetian, and it gets really heated, and nobody knows still that this is a prince, and um, it gets so heated that the count rushes into the room, and he lets out, prince, and then everyone's like, and like half of the room leaves, and the other half stay, and people who stay, they're like, oh, your life is in jeopardy now because this Venetian will surely try to kill you tonight over this, this, uh, you know, because the prince is very insulting to this Venetian. And they're like, come with me. And then another one's like, no, 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 come with me. And, and so the count and the prince are like, oh my God, this is bad. So they leave on their own to go back to their hotel and then they get, you know, kind of like herded onto a gondolier by a crowd of people and they're led up this long uh, spiraling staircase into this like very unknown secretive part of the the city and at that point who wants to read what happens I okay uh, at that at the end we stepped into a room where the blindfolds were taken from our eyes we found ourselves in a circle of venerable old men, old lord in black. The entire room hung with black tapestries and dimly lit, deadly stillness in the entire gathering, which made a horrible impression. Once of once of the sorry, I think it's one the same of the venerables, here. presumably the supreme state inquisitor, approached and asked the prince in a solemn tone, as the Venetian was being led forward, "Do you recognize this man here?" as the same who insulted you in the coffee house. Yes, answered the prince. Thereupon the inquisitor turned into the turned to the prisoner. Is is this the person you intended to have killed this evening? Yes, replied the prisoner. All at once the circle opened and with horror we saw the head of the Venetian parted from his torso. Is this sufficient satisfaction for you? the state inquisitor inquired. But the prince lay unconscious in the arms of his attendants. Mm -hmm. Go now, commanded the inquisitor in a horrible voice, and turning to me said, And in the future do not be so precipitous in your judgment of justice in Venice. Mm -hmm. So you see, this guy who is uh, getting hired an assassin to kill the prince ends up being caught by the state inquisition. The state inquisition interferes and they lop his head off in front of the prince. <laughs> so. As soon as, basically, as soon as they discover the identity of the prince, things happen fast in Venice. They intervened because they're like, well, we definitely can use this guy. And so from that point on, he is kind of under protection in Venice, but because they have plans for him. Mm -hmm. um, I'm gonna say it. So at this point, People know who the prince is, and he starts to develop this entourage around him in Venice. So he's walking down the streets, and all these people want to like come join in, and uh, they find themselves at this like hotel where they're all having dinner, and then this talk of a séance comes up, and um, this person, a Sicilian who's a magician, says that he can he can basically um, he can do certain types of magic, and at that point the prince. The prince's interest uh, is is peaked. Do I have this copy here? Um, the prince's yeah. curiosity was yeah. already peaked. Yeah. So the the prince's curiosity is peaked, and um, I think what we'll do is we'll 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 have someone read it before I go further. I'll read. Um, the prince's curiosity was already peaked to the highest pitch. To be in contact with the world of spirits had previously been his most ardent desire. 
And, after the initial appearance of the Armenian, all of the ideas began to whirl in him once more, the which his more mature reason has shunned for so long. You have here before you, the prince went on, one who is burning with impatience to bring this important matter to a conviction. I would embrace him who could dispel my doubts and draw the shades from my eyes as my benefactor. What do you demand of me? asked the magician. For now, just an example of your art. Let me see an apparition. What purpose would that serve? said the magician. The prince, then, from closer acquaintance with me, you may judge whether I am worthy of higher instruction. So, it's interesting to note here that the prince has a ready tendency to accept more that he has a special selection in the sacred secret, uh, secrets, the secret sciences, the, the supernatural, rather than his selection as a king. He shirks away from his duty as a king, but he thinks that he has this power within the sacred secrets. Um, he dismisses his potential future as king and rather is much more ready to believe, right, I just said that, um, and also that this idea of the sacred um, sciences is by initiation, right? So the word mysticism, which is derived from Greek, Juan probably knows the word, yeah, meaning to conceal, and its derivative, mystikos, meaning an initiate. So in the Hellenistic world, mystical referred to secret religious rituals. A mystikos was an initiate of a mystery religion. So, you know, the prince is basically the kind of Christian that thinks of his religion because he was not raised on, like, he, as they say, he didn't ask questions, he never came to really discover something. Religion has always been, at its, like, most intriguing to him, a mystery religion, which you can only gain knowledge through by being an initiate. Um, what is it? The theologians give the name mystery to, re to revealed truths that surpass the powers of natural reason. So in a narrow sense, the mystery is a truth that transcends created intellect. You can't come to know this through reason. You have to be initiated into the secret arts. Um, I think that's all I'll say for that part. <clears throat> So um, the seance happens and there's something very strange that goes on. So there's supposed to be an apparition of the prince's friend. And as this first apparition appears, a second apparition all of a sudden appears and starts talking over that one. And this one is apparently like even more real and more believable. And the magician is like struck in like, oh my God, like he obviously was not expecting the second apparition and he falls to his knees and then he sees one of the members of this entourage, which is a Russian, and he shrieks and the Russian's like, you'll never conjure magic anymore, something like that. And then the Sicilian faints and we come to realize that the Russian was actually the Armenian the whole time that was in this kind of disguise in their group. The police, the Venetian police come in almost on cue and the Armenian talks to the police, shows them some papers, and everyone's free to go except for the Sicilian, who's then put in prison. At this point, the prince says, who wants to read? Uh, I, can, I can read it. Uh, and to what end did you design all of this? Oh, wait, no, no that's a higher power. higher power. Oh, I'm sorry. A higher power is pursuing me. Omniscience hovers over me. An invisible being whom I cannot escape watches my every step. I must find the Armenian, and he will shed light on this. The person is everywhere he wants to be, and everything the moment dictates he ought to be. No mortal has yet learned what he actually is. Did you see how the Sicilian crumpled when he screamed the words into his ear? You shall never summon spirits again? There is more behind it. No one can convince me that someone can be so terrified of something human. So, um, yeah. Um, again, this idea of like, what is the evil? What is the nature of evil? Um, the prince cannot 
think of the Armenian as a human at this point because there's just so much mystery and power and intrigue around the men. Um, so the prince, the count, and this other person that was part of their entourage, they decide to visit the Sicilian, the magician, in prison the next day because they want to ask him a few questions. And um, I guess we can just go into go into it because the prince is very puzzled, you know, like why bother orchestrating this very complex, intricate fraud on me? Um, so he asks, who wants to, who wants to read it? Who, someone can be the prince and someone can be the magician. I can be the prince. And to what end did you design all of this? Okay, I will be the magician. <laughs> in order to make you reflective, in order to prepare an emotional condition in, in you that would make you the most receptive for the wonders that I had in store for you. The adventure with the Armenian permitted me to hope that you would already be inclined to dismiss natural explanations and to look for traces of higher sources of the extraordinary. Indeed, remarked the prince in a manner or at once chagrinny and amazed. I had not expect that. So, it's not really a reason, right? The prince asks, why did you do all of this? And the magician basically says, well, I saw because the prince was talking on and on about the Armenian that night. Uh, the, the magician's like, well, I heard that you were talking about these things, and so I thought that you would be easier prey, um, that you would be more likely to dismiss natural explanations, and that you would want the higher sources of the extraordinary. But he doesn't still say, well, why? Why did you do it? Is it really just a common fraud for people's money? Um, so here the prince is very embarrassed. Uh, because it basically has been exposed that something that he was talking very seriously with this magician for saying like, you know, if I do well with this lesson, maybe you'll consider, you know, initiating me into the secret sciences. It's been now exposed as a fraud and the prince is incredibly embarrassed that he believed he fell so hard for something that was such a base fraud. Um, so then the Sicilian goes on to explain, because the, the prince is like, okay, but you know, you haven't explained why you were so deathly scared of the Armenian when you saw him. And uh, the Sicilian's like, well, I'll tell you a story of how I first met the Armenian, which we don't have time to go into too much detail, but there are important parts of the story because basically this family loses their first son, but they never find his body. They're not sure if he died out at sea or whatnot. And this first son was to be betrothed to the daughter of this other important family. And mm -hmm. everything's kind of just held frozen because they're hoping to find still the first son and they can't, they can't move past this. So they want some kind of confirmation that the son is actually dead. And this is where the magician gets hired into the family to, because all natural devices had failed, that possibly the secret sciences could reveal something to them. Um, I'll read this part. So he's saying um, about this family, this family might well require one such as I in this very serious matter. Indeed, in order to obtain, in order to possibly obtain some insight by means of my secret sciences, whereas all natural devices have been exhaustively and fruitlessly attempted. Then he goes on to explain what technique he used. He basically says that by using the mystical, mystical books in the considerable library of the old Marquis, this is the head of the family, I was soon able to speak to him in his own language and to bring my system of the invisible world into agreement with his own opinions. In a short while, he believed everything I wanted him to believe, and would have sworn with as much confidence upon the copulation of philosophers with salamanders and sylphs as upon a book of the Bible. As he was highly religious, and his capacity for faith had been highly developed in this school, my own stories found access all the easier. 
so that in the end I had so bound and knitted him up with mysticisms that he would credit nothing natural any longer. In short, I was the revered apostle of the house. He goes on to say, in organizing this seance, because he's going to organize the seance of the older brother, but it's obviously not true, he said, I never confronted mistrust on the matter itself. Doubt in my arts was the only obstacle I did not have to struggle with. Mm -hmm. Which is very interesting that this is a common phenomenon, you know, amongst everyone that, you know, once you say, we're going to, we're going to have like a seance, we're going to raise a spirit, there are certain things that occur with the mind that kind of shut off in, in thinking, if you allow yourself to really believe in it. Um, so, and it's interesting, right, that he went into the library and he looked at the old man's specific type of mystical books so that he could understand where his um, weak spots of the mind were, basically, so that he could more easily manipulate his mind and his conviction in things. Um, so he goes on to say about this seance, um, you will note that nothing was more dangerous to me than a certain approximation to the natural. So in other words, people are not suspicious of supernatural explanations because it is beyond understanding, it is beyond reason. Therefore, if they can be convinced that they saw something partaking in the mystical, that is all the conviction they need. They only need to uh, be convinced by their senses. The mind plays no role in this domain, since it is not something that can be rash it's not something that can be rationalized. When the magician says nothing is more dangerous than the approximation to the natural, it's because as soon as the illusion or effect appears natural rather than supernatural, our mind kicks back into gear, it's mm. engaged again. Therefore, if you were a fraudster like this magician, nothing would be more dangerous than to allow someone's mind to be turned on. The prince ironically agrees with this, even though he's in the middle of such a plot and he's totally falling for it. Um, who, is it really that? I mean, basically the prince is just saying um, that obviously the more probable is the most dis disruptive in this extraordinary, this belief of extraordinary phenomena. And at this point too, the prince is pretty embarrassed, so he has to be like, yes, 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 exactly, this is how it works. <laughs> I wasn't duped at all last night. <clears throat> um, so at this point, the prince is disgusted with himself, but there's something else that's happened. Because uh, Schiller makes a point, his convictions were not made on firm foundation, his um, understanding of his religion was also not made on firm foundation. His religion caused him to believe in miracles, like in a mystical sense, and by the seance being so, showing itself so transparently as such a base, lowly fraud, the prince is actually like he's going through a bit of a crisis now because he doesn't know now what do I understand I've just mm. been like uh, proven that something that I totally was falling for was a complete fraud also it sort of shook his connection to his religion since his religion was largely based on the the miraculous mystical aspects not yeah. the more moral aspects yeah so it actually shook that yes okay yeah, and that was like his more free understanding of religion because he was mm -hmm. actually raised as a child in a very disciplinary religion, um, religious environment, which Schiller goes into later on. And he oriented himself to a more mystical belief of religion, which he thought himself to be more free within. Mm -hmm. um, so once this fraud is exposed to him, um, the pure world of the sacred sciences which he really regards as pure. The mystical world beyond our own has been sullied by such a good-for-nothing fraudster. He is embarrassed that he fell so hard for the whole affair. This disgust seems at first to have lifted the prince out of his dream state and awakens him to explain mechanically how every trick could have been done without magic. So there are several things that happened. You know, I didn't have enough time to go through all of them. And the prince actually very astutely starts to explain all of the things 
in a way that doesn't partake in, in the magic, um, except when it comes to explaining, well, how did the Armenian know that my cousin was going to die at 9 o'clock? Mm -hmm. So and he wasn't even dead yet. This causes yeah, a, a <laughs> yeah, it causes a breakdown for him, and it falls apart, especially because there's still no intention, there is no purpose that has been able to identify the whole intricate affair. Mm -hmm. So even if you can explain mechanically each little affair, it becomes more and more ridiculous if you try to put it under a larger scope of comprehension. It's like, you know, like, but still, why is any of this happening? The prince uh, goes even so far, which we'll read actually, before I go further, who wants to read that long quote of the prince where he's kind of trying to reconstruct his understanding of um, what has just happened. I believe. What do all miracles prove? Yeah. Yeah. Is this the one? Uh, I believe this to have been correctly judged. Said oh, no, no, we, I, I skipped that one because it wasn't. It's the next what one. What do all the miracles prove if I can prove that just one of them is a fraud? Once we concede that the Armenian has an uh, important plan one in which I am either the target or in which I am to be used as a means. And must we not concede this, whatever judgment we make of him as a person, then nothing is unnatural, nothing forced, which leads him to his goal over the shortest possible path. What shorter path to assure oneself of a person than the credentials of a miracle worker? Who would resist a man before whom the spirits themselves need? But I grant you that my conjecture is fabricated. I admit I am not satisfied with it myself. I do not even insist upon its veracity because I do not think it worth the trouble to make use of a fabricated and circumspect scheme where mere accidents, where mere accidents suffices. What, I interrupted, it was supposedly a mere accident that scarcely anything more. The Armenian knew what danger my cousin was in. He met us on St. Mark's Square. The opportunity invited him to dare a prophecy, which, if it failed to hit its mark, was merely a lost word or two. But if it struck true, might have the most important consequences. Success crowned the attempt, and only then might he have considered using the gift of chance for an interconnected plan. Time will clarify the secret. Or perhaps, but not believe me, uh, perhaps not, but believe me, friend, as he laid his hand on me and assumed a very serious demeanor. A person before whom higher forces kneel will have no need of charlatry, or he will despise it. So, <clears throat> the prince is still not really coming to any discovery here. And he says, what do all miracles prove if I can prove just one of them as a fraud? Basically, because his world has been so shattered in what he believed in, he now has kind of lost belief in anything. He doesn't have a foundation to believe in anything. And he doubts and is suspect to everything. He goes so far as to say, the Armenian uh, probably has me as a target, or I'm to be used as a means to uh, a goal. And he actually has it for a moment. But then, because he can't explain, and he, and he says, what better way for this Armenian to have sway than to pretend to be a miracle worker? Because again, our ability to detect what his intention is or to, to question what's going on uh, where we're, it's a lot harder. Um, so he's, he's doing pretty good, but then because he can't explain how the Armenian knew that the cousin would die at nine o'clock, he goes on to say, I'm not really satisfied with anything I just spent two pages explaining in a very intricate and very detailed manner, and I was actually right in a lot of it, but I just couldn't get the purpose yet. Why can't he get the purpose? Because it's an evil purpose. <laughs> It's an evil human purpose. And so he doesn't understand it. And he says, you know, I didn't convince myself. And I think, you know, chance could really just explain all of this. Like, it just all kind of happened by accident. And 
you know, the Armenian just kind of said, hey, I should just test out my luck and I'll guess nine o'clock tonight. And he then happened to be right. And once he was right, he was like, well, I can kind of use this for more of a plan. What is that plan? I don't know. Uh, maybe it'll reveal itself to me at some point. If not, well, okay. But higher forces do not kneel to charlatanry or they will despise it. And it's kind of like, what? So are you back now to believing in the supernatural and the, the mystical? Um, so due to his inability to explain mechanically like he did with the other cons, how the Armenian was able to make his first chilling prediction, the prince never fathomed or brought into consideration that this whole series of events could have been orchestrated by a true villainy within Venice that was focused on the prince for a very exact purpose. The purpose was never suspected by the prince for why would anyone go through the trouble of weaving such a series of very odd and intricate events just to toy with the prince's mind. Such a thing was really unfathomable and thus it was never understood and an evil motive was never suspected. It always partook in the illusion of something supernatural and therefore it was beyond judgment. Um, do you guys need a, a bit of a break? Do you need to, do you want a, a 10 minute break? Yeah? Or if you're the only one that I'm not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we took a break pretty much at the end of, um, of book one. But um, the Count, again, who's narrating this whole thing, he says, Thus ended a conversation which I have set down here in its entirety because it demonstrates the difficulties to be surmounted with the prince, that he fell blindly and unreflecting into the snare laid for him by a shocking deviltry. Not everyone, perhaps looking down upon his weaknesses in mockery and in the proud darkness of his own untested reason, thinking himself justified in breaking the staff of damnation over the prince, I say that not everyone, I fear, would have withstood even this first test in such a manly fashion. If now, even after this fortunate preparation, you see him fall, nonetheless, you will ridicule his folly less than you will be astounded at the immensity of the villainy that slew such well-defended reason. So it's just a reminder for us to not be too hard on the prince, since because it's presented to us in such a way, it's easy for us to say, well, I see what's going on, it's so obvious. But most people, including ourselves, would not actually fare so well if we actually found ourselves in a position where we were profiled and all kinds of weirdness happened um, to disorganize us. Mm. So the Good counter... Thing that never happened to us. I would know yeah, exactly I know. what should be. Yeah. <laughs> I would uh, know exactly what <laughs> Don't talk to strangers. Don't eat candy from strangers. <laughs> and don't, don't eat cakes like this. Don't get into <laughs> big star tinted vans. From Amsterdam. So the count says, Forgive me the tears that fall involuntarily to the memory of my most dear friend. I write this down as a tribute to justice. He was a noble person and would certainly have become an ornament to the throne if he had not let himself be so deluded as to want to ascend it in crime. So it's foreshadowing that the prince will become the king of this territory, but that he ascends it in crime. So in the second part of the book, the count goes through um, a description of now how the prince has changed since this uh, variations of events that are very were very weird um, that he is still kind of like confused as to why this all happened um, but because you know everyone has to operate you know most people don't think about how things are organized in terms of truth and so forth in their minds very much However, in order for us to function, we have to have some kind of structure. And because the prince's structure was completely annihilated, mm. he is now reeling from that, and he has to try to assimilate what is that structure supposed to be. 
However, you have to have the right method to rebuild yourself up if that structure was totally um, destroyed. So who wants to read the... Just quick, how yeah. much time has, has uh, passed between book one and book two now? Very little, very little amount of time. The whole story itself, where the Count isn't even there uh, later on for many months, is about a year <clears throat> okay. since the beginning of the story. So mm -hmm. this whole transformation of the prince is within a year. Okay. Um, yeah, who wants to read the first book? Book two? Yeah. Uh, not long afterwards, I began to notice significant changes in the prince's state of mind. Up to this time, the prince had avoided any strict examination of his faith and was quite content to verify, to verify the crude and sensuous notions of religion he had been raised with by means of the better ideas he subsequently assimilated, but without investigating the foundations of his belief, beliefs. He once confessed to me that the objects of religion were always like an enchanted castle to him, one into which a person did not step without shuddering, and one was better off passing it, passing it by in respectful resignation without running the risk of losing one's way in its labyrinths. Our prince was haunted by dark and ghastly shapes his entire youth. Joy was banned even from his play. All of his ideas about religion had something horrible about them. Things dreadful and brutal were the first to take command of his lively imagination, and they made the most lasting impression. His god was an image of horror, a vengeful being, his worship a slavish covering, a blind submission that suffocated all power and boldness. Religion was at odds with everything his youthful heart yearned for. He never knew it was uh, he never knew it as a blessing, rather only as a hostage to his passions. Gradually, a quiet rancor against religion caught fire in his heart, making for the most bizarre mixture of respectful faith and blind fear in his heart and mind. A repugnance for the Lord, before whom he felt an equal degree of horror and awe. I think that's fairly straightforward, so we'll keep reading. Um, we we'll want to read the next section. No wonder he grasped at the first opportunity to escape such a heavy yoke. But he fled like a bonded slave from his cruel master, carrying the feeling of his slavery with him into freedom. For this reason, because he had not renounced his beliefs of his youth in calm reflection, before, because he had not waited until his more mature reason was able to ease itself free, because he had fled like a refugee, while his lord's rights to possession still held. For these reasons, after ever so many distractions, he always needed to return to him. He had fled with his chains, and for that reason was necessarily easy prey to every villain who discovered him, discovered them. The course of this story will show, in case the reader has not already guessed as much, that such a villain did indeed appear. Mm. The confessions of the Sicilian had left impressions in his heart with more significance than their object was worth, and the slight victory that his reason had carried over this paltry deception had remarkably increased his confidence in his powers. The ease with which he was able to discover the fraud seemed to have surprised even him. Truth and falsehood had not yet separated themselves so precisely in his mind for him not to confuse the pillars of the one with the pillars of the other rather often. Thus the blow delivered to his belief in miracles shook the entire edifice of his religious faith. Its effect, its effect upon him was like that of an inexperienced person, cheated in friendship or love because he had chosen badly, who now loses faith in those very emotions because he had once taken fortuitous impressions for real and true qualities. A deception discovered made him suspicious of the truth as well because the truth had unfortunately been proven with the same bad reasons. Mm -hmm. A skepticism blossoming in him from this point onward had no mercy even toward things most worthy of reverence. So again, as we were saying, because his, his blow to his belief in miracles uh, was destroyed, uh, sorry, that was badly worded, but he didn't have a foundation 
to place his beliefs on anything after that. And he was um, suspicious of everything, just like he says, a cheated person in friendship or love, where you mistook a person for giving you true friendship or true love, and because you were cheated in it, you think that it doesn't exist, friendship and love, when really you just chose badly who to believe in or how to believe in it. And this was the case for the prince in not just his religion, but, you know, understanding what religion means, your idea of your relationship to the universal, the infinite, something larger than yourself, that was uh, annihilated for the prince. He became a skeptic, he was critical of everything around him, um, even things most worthy of reverence. So things even most pure, most beautiful, most dignified, angelic, he could not believe in that anymore. Mm -hmm. Um, who wants to read the next part? Um, okay. Um, in short, he had immersed himself in this labyrinth like a fanatic, with scores of articles of faith, and left it a skeptic, finally even a confirmed free thinker. Among the circles into which he had been drawn, there was a certain closed society, called the Bucentaro. Mm -hmm which promoted the most unrestrained license of opinions, as well as morals, under the guise of a noble, reasonable freedom of thought. Here the prince forgot that libertinism of the mind and morals among persons in these positions, priests and cardinals, is all the more pronounced, because here it finds no reins, and is not deterred by any such aura of sanctity as often... Lens? Lens. Blinds the, oh, blinds the eyes, sorry. Um, more profane. And this was the case in the Bucentaro. Most of the, most of whose members... Sorry, I can't read it. Reviled. Reviled. Not only their positions, but humanity itself. Mere f uh, fami familiarity with this sort of people and their habits, although he did not imitate them, was sufficient for him to lose the pure and beautiful innocence of his character and tastes. His understanding, with so little of firm knowledge, was enabled to free itself from the sophisms it had become entangled in, without outside aid and imperceptibility, this ghastly corrosive gnawed everything away, nearly everything, upon which his morality should have rested. He shunned the natural pillars of happiness as sophisms which abandoned him in decisive moments, and thereby he found himself compelled to grasp at first arbitrary best uh, at the first arbitrary best thing tossed at him. Um, so this Bucentoro is uh, a closed society that has very important people in it, not just uh, statesmen but cardinals, and this very much impresses the prince at first. Although, as we just did an overview of what cardinals in Venice were like, yeah. what a den of, you know, snakes he's entering. And um, he thinks that these cardinals are divine people, where Schiller says, um, you know, people in these types of positions, the prince again doesn't understand the nature of evil, people in these positions find no reins, they're, they're at the top of the authority of what is moral, and therefore the corruption at this level, unfortunately, is very high. And where a more common person would feel fear for sanctity, like, you know, what is going to happen to their soul when they die and all this, the cardinals actually um, are not as afraid um, of these kinds of consequences. I mean, obviously, they don't really believe in them and uh, that they actually revile their positions, they revile humanity. But the prince mm -hmm. discovers this somewhat partially, but when it's already too late. And um, at that point, he's even scared, it's said, to leave this group. Mm -hmm. um, and just being in contact with these people was sufficient for him to lose his pure and beautiful innocence of character and taste. Mm -hmm. 
quite powerful because again he didn't have a strong foundation to base that on it became rather free-floating and instinctive for him and when he came across these really terrible people who had a much more mental rigor to manipulate someone's uh, mind his, uh, he, he, his innocence could not withstand that and he was reduced at the end of it um, grabbing at the best arbitrary thing tossed at him. Like, what a sad situation for a person at this point. So, um, I'm going to skip through a lot of what happens in book two, because I think you guys should just read the whole thing for yourself. But um, the philosophical dialogue is, is very much key, and this is where you're tested now on the battleground of could you hold your own in such a situation as what the prince has been put in, in the safe ground of philosophical dialogue. We don't uh, thankfully have to live what the prince is going through. Um, so Schiller actually extended the length of this because I think people were obviously not paying enough attention to it and it is a central part of the ghost here. And here the prince is speaking to the Baron, which is kind of his servant, uh, who's also his friend. They've known each other since they were very young. And the Count at this point um, has been sent off to deal with something in his own homeland, and he finds out later that he was purposefully, there was uh, trouble in his own homeland for him to deal with that was set up purposefully so that he would have to leave the prince's side in Venice. So the prince is by himself and he's just getting worse and worse in his compartment. Um, and his friend, the baron, is very concerned uh, for him. So they end up having a philosophical dialogue. It's, um, I was already explaining it to some of the people who came here all the time, no, I'm joking, <laughs> that uh, it's like a Socratic platonic dialogue, but you don't have the guiding light of Socrates that's with you in this. So it's really just the prince who's guiding this dialogue, who has a lot of problems, a lot of holes in his thinking, contradictions, and so forth, and the baron is not able to hold his own in it, but the baron has still a morality embedded within him, that he can see what's happening to the prince, but he can't intellectually hold his own against these sophisticated arguments of the free thinkers, the Aristotelians. So I broke it into kind of core subject matters, which they're going to overlap, but um, these are the things that Schiller um, rightly identifies as um, major uh, structural stones for free thinkers, which we can discuss and see what we think of them. So the first part is the nature of an eternal higher order. So here the prince uh, describes that he no longer believes in, I mean, he never really believed in entirely a benevolent God, right? As was explained before, he had like a love and hate relationship with a God that he thought was sometimes loving and sometimes wrathful. Now he's replaced that with just a faceless, cold nature alien world, um, and he describes it, can you demand of this higher order, this nature, that which it does not itself possess? So it's not a pers person, that's not a personification or anything. Can you, a ripple that the wind blows over the surface of the sea, can you demand that a trace of your existence be secured on that surface? So this cold alien world, we are like these material vessels to the will of this cold nature, but it's not something that we can know. And these things like love or hate, um, they don't really exist in this, at best to describe alien world, but we'll go into it a bit more um, later on. The question then of the nature of immortality, right? The impulse to eternally lasting existence. The prince says, I will concede in the context, dearest friend, if you can prove to me that this impulse to immortality in men is not consumed as completely with the temporal purpose of existence as the sensual drives are. So 
anything material about us, including our, our material desires, you have to prove to me that these are not also extinguished. Basically, the prince um, says he believes that nature puts this idea of impulse of immortality into us, um, but it's so that we do its will, we execute its, its actions. So you can think of it sort of like Dawkins' theory, where the genes are what ultimately dictate anything in us, benevolence, like you want to protect your children or this. It's ultimately because you want to protect the genes that you propagated, and it's a very much this idea of like a cold nature in that sense. And this is what the prince is talking about. Um, the impulse to immortality is an illusion <coughs> placed within us just so that we fulfill the intended effect of nature, which we are not fully aware of or aware at all. So then it goes on to this question of purpose and means. Um, because obviously if you live in such a world like this, you can't know purpose. And uh, the prince goes on to say, we ought never to have said purpose at all. To adopt your manner of expressing it, I derived this concept from the moral world because here we are accustomed to call the consequences of an action its purpose. In the soul, indeed, purpose has priority over means, that is, uh, action. But when their internal effects go over into the world outside, this order is reversed, and means are related to purpose like cause and effect. Therefore, our judgments of whether something is noble or common merely denote the relationship in which that object stands to a certain principle in our soul. Thus, it is a concept applicable only within, not outside our soul. In other words, the purpose of humanity is subject to the physical world. And he's going to go into that more further on because it's a, it's a very contradictory way of, of thinking. Um, he goes on to say that pleasure and pain are the greatest uh, measures of pleasure is the greatest measure of good and pain is the greatest measure of bad. But it's not an evil intention, it's not an evil consciousness, so to speak. So he says, through pain and pleasure, the moral entity experiences only the relationship of this present condition to the condition of his highest perfection. So you are in your highest perfection according to what nature intended for you if you seek out pleasure. Because nature give, gave you this idea of pleasure so that you would do its will. It gave you pain so that you would uh, refrain from things it did not want you to accomplish. Um, again, thinking beings are governed by pleasure and pain to fit the purpose of nature. Organic entities, so you know, he makes the uh, reference to like a water droplet. This is constrained by nature in terms of laws of physics. But humans have the laws of emotion that keep us bounded to nature's intended design. So like a planet has its shape because of, of gravity working on it and so forth, it's kept in its certain kind of self-compartmentalized entity being and Humans are guided by this, not by gravity or so forth, but by uh, avoidance of pain and the desire and seeking of pleasure. Thus men need not be cognizant of the purpose which nature carries out through them. They simply just need to follow pleasure and avoid pain. I'm going to keep going a little bit further and then we'll, we'll discuss these things. The concept of mind and the order of nature. So the prince says, you know, to the baron, you want to grant nature or this like eternal higher order, you want to grant it a mind. Um, because the self-serving person would like to bring his species everything good and beautiful because he was so pleased to have a creator in the family. But he's, the prince is saying that the eternal higher order does not have a mind, not in anything relatable to what our mind is. He says, if you gave a crystal the ability to have ideas, its greatest world plan will be crystallization, <laughs> and its godhead will be the most beautiful form of crystal. 
And this is how he thinks of, of nature. It's not anything that we can really partake or relate in. We're not the children of this, this thing. Um, and it does not have a human mind. Uh, the Baron brings up the point, if man cannot deviate from his center point, how does the prince so arrogantly assert that he knows the course of nature, right? It's like if, if we don't know how to understand nature, just as people who say there's no truth out there, mm -hmm. and then it's like, well, how do you know that your statement of there's no truth was, is truthful? Mm. And it's, a, it's a, an in, inherently contradictory statement to make. And this is what the prince is, uh, is saying here. Like, how can you say that we can't know the course of nature and it has all these, you know, guiding principles to it if we can't know it? Where did you get this all from? The prince says, I do not determine anything. I, as people who say there's no truth, I don't determine anything. I merely disregard what men have confused with nature, what they have taken from their own breasts and pompously dressed her up with. What preceded me and what will come after me I see as two black, impenetrable curtains hanging down on both sides of human life, curtains no mortal has yet lifted. So there, there's this idea of nothing before you, nothing after you, and there's no point in you even trying to think about it, because no mortal will ever be able to enter past those curtains. Um, then he goes on to say, man has no value than his effects. The Baron says, uh, his friend, therefore that person in whom the reason for numerous effects is contained would be the most excellent person? How can that be? Is there then no longer any difference between good and bad? Moral beauty is lost. So again, thinking about the Dawkins theory of genes, like every action we do, if it really is governed by our genes, the more action, the more successful you are and potent you are in action, must be the, the you are the superior form. You are the, the best form of what nature intended you to do. And um, the Baron brings up, but how can you measure just the amount of action? How do you di differentiate between good and bad? Um, isn't there isn't there still a purpose behind these things? And he says moral beauty is, is lost if you go about it this way. The prince answers, the feeling of moral difference is something far more important to me than my reason. Your morality needs something to support it while mine rests upon its own axes. Is there questions so far? I know yes. it's a lot. It's an advanced philosophy. I'm going to keep going because I think that all these things, they actually kind of are building blocks for what we're going to be going further into. And then when we go into those things, I'm going to ask people to try to refute what the prince is saying. But the most important points to, to keep in mind is that it's a cold alien world without a mind, not a human mind, that we ultimately just know. We can't know its intention, but we should just follow the pleasure uh, desires that we have and uh, avoid the, the pain and um, that our effects are the greatest measure of good, like goodness, morality, all this, the prince has redefined purpose. They're all, they have all been redefined under the, the prince's context of things. So he goes on to try to explain this really weird um, philosophy, the effect of two burning candles. He says, you have one burning candle in like a poor man's hut, you have another burning the understanding only comprehends as holes, exists as holes in the real world. So he doesn't believe in the universal. He doesn't believe that things are ordered from top down. He believes that we are just executions of parts of things and that we can't know what the whole, the intention for the whole is. Uh, so he says, one can only assess the initial effect not the entire chain of effects of our actions. And since we cannot know the entire chain of effects of our actions, we cannot know its reason or purpose. He goes on to explain another example of two beggars. If I give one beggar a coin and he chooses to use this coin to help his sick uncle, then, you know, the baron, he gives a coin 
and that guy chooses to use that coin to buy a weapon and murder someone. Um, he said, we're equal because all we did was give a coin to a beggar. We're not responsible for what else happens afterwards. The effect of my act ceased to be my act with its immediacy, just as yours did. But the Baron brings up, okay, but what if I gave him the coin with the intended effect that he would kill that guy? Doesn't that kind of change the story? <laughs> and the Prince goes on to say, which is quite the acrobatics and philosophy, there's no immediate connection. For an entire series of arbitrary events will insert themselves in between each effect outside of himself, which a person brings forth, and the inner cause or the will. So you might as well admit it at once that both acts are equivalent in their effects. They're morally indifferent. Oh, regardless of our intention. The regardless act of is our intention, because when I give the coin to this guy, there are so many other things that happen before this guy can finally kill the other person. Mm -hmm. So I'm not responsible. Because there's an infinite division. Yeah, there's all these things that could have stopped him or promoted him from doing it. So even if it was my intention uh, to give him a coin to do this, I'm not responsible for it. Yeah. And so this question of motive uh, comes up. Do evil acts have motives? The prince exclaims, if good and bad predicates exist only in the soul, then we can ignore the external acts for now. So in other words, my intention for giving a coin is what matters right now. So it's not really in the realm of action. It's more in the realm of intention. It's within my soul that I'm deciding this. We'll keep it to questioning that for now. So <clears throat> it doesn't matter, right? If I'm a moral person and I want a good intended effect, if I fail at that good effect, does that mean now I'm not a moral person? No, mm -hmm. right? I mean, it depends on the context, but if someone, you know, like Machiavelli organizing the League of Cambrai against Venice, a moral thing, but it didn't become successful, does that mean now Machiavelli is no longer moral because the action wasn't successful? No. Mm -hmm. Therefore, morality is not contingent upon the success of your action. This is what uh, the prince is saying. Therefore, we don't even need to look at external acts right now. Let's just look at, at that. So he goes on to say, nothing but the inner drive to give effect to all its forces, which is the equivalent of achieving the highest proclamation of its existence. So um, here, I'll just read the whole thing. It is in this condition that we presume the perfection of the moral being, just as we say that a clock is perfect, when all the parts out of which the artisan constructed it correspond to the effect on whose account he constructed it. So he's comparing a moral being to a well-functioning clock. And the more forces that are active within us, um, this is what nature intended for us, the more of a, 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 a better functioning clock we are. Um, he goes on to say, we denote the name morality, and whether an act is morally good or morally evil depends on whether it approximates or deviates from this principle, or whether it promotes or hinders this principle. Now, since the principle is nothing but the most perfect activity of all the powers of a person, is a good act to that in which more forces were active, and an evil one that in which less were active. So again, as a clock, if a clock works, it has to have so many parts working for the clock's function. The more parts that are not working, the, 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 the less perfect this clock is going to be. It might be able to still have time, but it won't be time reflective of how we want it and so forth. Just as a person, the more parts of us that are working, the, the more, it, in order to do a good act, basically, you have to have more powers within you, more parts within you that are working for a good effect versus a bad effect is like your um, a, a clock that's not working, your parts are not working. So the bad effect is a less potent, um, less, um, there are less forces within you that are acting such that the result that comes out is of a lower order. So he's basically saying that nature has constructed us in such a way that if we have a strong action we have a perfect activity it's because the parts that nature has given us 
are functioning in its most forceful, most potent manner. And if we have parts that are um, not functioning well, that's what is considered a bad act. Can, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. Um, when he's talking about the, the parts within us, this is the prince talking, right? So when the, yeah. when the prince is talking about these parts within us that are either uh, more potent or less, such that our effects are more or less, mm -hmm. it, does he mean like powers, qualities, talents, or does he mean like complexity of, of, of power of thinking? Like what, what, do you have an idea of what sorts of internal uh, parts he's talking about? You can just think of if someone is more successful in the actions that they decide to, to take, hmm. like the, the outcome is successful, it's because already this is a contradiction from what he was saying before. But anyway, it means that they had to have, um, it's considered good. It's kind of like saying the strongest are meant to rule. Hmm. The strongest are the good the superior is the good, the superior is the strongest, the weak, just as how like, you know, in the, 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 the books by Plato, they have this weird idea of speaking time to sometimes when they measure good and bad on things. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the weaker you are, it's the law that you should be ruled, mm -hmm. you know, sort of thing. So in this case, he's saying that the good will automatically just have more forces active within them. And a bad person you can kind of look at as a loser sleeping on their mother's couch kind of thing. Like they're just, they're impotent. They're not, they're not doing things, you know, they're not successful. And so in that sense, when you start looking at it that way, where's this concept of evil? Where's this concept of villainy? You're basically saying that if you have an evil purpose, you cannot be more successful than a moral person because you have less forces active within you. You're just inherently inferior and you're, you should not even be worried about. And as we see with the idea of the Venetians, this is totally <clears throat> ignorant. It's like naive to think that evil is so base, so, I mean, evil is inferior to good, but it doesn't mean that it doesn't have great force mm -hmm. if you allow it mm -hmm. to. I have a thought. Uh, yeah. Can I have share a thought? Yes. Based on what you were saying. Um, well, I had two thoughts. Well, I, I liked what you were saying about um, like the whole docking, like when you, you mentioned the docking things and the genes and how like this idea that it's all predetermined. <coughs> and to, but then, um, well, I wrote here, a real issue is people doubt that there is such thing as evil intent because there's, <coughs> a, you know, you have the note right there. Uh, do evil acts have motives? Uh, and it's like, okay, pe what really people actually struggle with is that there would be like these kind of evil intentions to do such and such. Uh, and But what is it that this evil really wants to stop? And if you say that, well, it really wants to stop creativity, which sounds kind of strange, like what it really wants to stop <coughs> is uh, it doesn't want people to act in creative ways, to change things, to create, uh, give, to d develop new ways of... Uh, higher forms of power to transform things uh, and have progress. And then you realize what people really don't believe, because in, in saying what, uh, in challenging this idea that people don't really recognize that there are evil motives, what they really don't believe in is creativity. Because once you, you get creativity and you think about what that really is, then you see where the evil would come in, that they want to stop that. But what people actually, I think, are clear on is what creativity really is. Yeah, and there, there is such a thing as evil creativity. Evil intent gives you a chance to actually, uh, it, you take this negative and you actually use it to actually investigate the positive, which is really what uh, the people aren't catching. Well, you know, Augustine is really interesting in, in this, which I think helped me a lot in thinking about this, because, you know, you, you come across it a lot where people just kind of make fun of evil Nowadays, they're like, they'll make fun of the Queen Queen Elizabeth or Prince Charles or something. And it's like, you know, it would be very serious if they decided to have focus on you and destroy your life. It's not looking good. You know, it, it's going to be hard to avoid uh, that intention. Um, but uh, it's hard for people to either recognize evil or to recognize how good can be superior to evil. Because mm. evil can also just seem all-encompassing, so powerful, you see it, it's much more prevalent. And St. Augustine, 
you know, says that uh, light exists on its own, whereas darkness is in measured degrees of absence of light. Mm -hmm. And um, that's a very powerful concept because when something has an evil intention or creativity or something, it has to partake in, you can say, partially good forces, but it manipulates them in a way to twist them unnaturally into something evil. And that's why it's inferior by nature, mm -hmm. because it has to borrow from the good in order to have any kind of mm -hmm. effect. Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that it's not incredibly dangerous and that we shouldn't be very careful. But if it confronts something that is good um, of the highest level, it cannot stand uh, against that. It, it won't have any power over it. Yeah. Also, uh, this yeah. another uh, impression I'm getting from uh, this, this idea of more forces active in, in a person uh, is that there's no unifying principle in that person. There's nothing regulating the for many forces of good or evil or mm -hmm. whatever they may be. Um, so there is no credit going to a person of, uh, of you know, uh, partaking in the universal creativity mm -hmm. or universal goodness or anything like that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the same goes for evil. That even for 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 committing something evil, it's some force. Oh, it was the devil, or it was. Oh, it must be my bad hand, or it, mm -hmm. oh, it was. Yeah, because the problem here is that this is ultimately a philosophy of a slave. Mm -hmm. He's laying out a philosophy of someone who is enslaved. Mm -hmm. And he thinks that he's somehow being free and a sovereign in talking about this. But he's enslaved because he denies purpose. And as soon as you deny purpose, you are going to be brought into some other person's purpose. Uh -huh. Which is what which is totally what hap is happening with this yeah. prince here. He's saying there's no purpose. There's, you know, mm. again when he right. said, I couldn't, um, I I don't know how the Armenian did this nine o'clock prediction, and therefore it could all be by chance. By denying purpose, you have completely now you cannot know, you can't predict anything that's going to happen to you. Yeah. You're mm. taking things as they come at you. Uh -huh. Um. So a good act is one with more forces active. So this is the prince's version of morality um, versus immorality. The prince says, therefore, an evil deed only negates that which is affirmed in a good deed. Therefore, I cannot say that an evil heart is necessary to commit a bad act. Because in this sense, again, a good act just has more forces active in it. A bad act has less forces active in it. So it's not necessarily that you're evil, that you're, for whatever reason, you don't have as many forces active within you to commit an act. Therefore, this idea of depravity um, being the absence of virtue, uh, foolishness, the absence of understanding, uh, one can hardly say that emptiness, quiet, or darkness exist. Depravity can hardly exist in a person or depravity at all in the entire moral world in, in this case. So it's just like a hierarchy, as we're going to get into, a hierarchy of good and lesser good. There really isn't a bad, there really isn't an evil in this viewpoint. So he goes on to explain this. We despise a person who flees and thereby escapes death. We don't like someone who runs away from something, not because we don't respect that someone wants to self-preserve themselves who it's because they surrendered to the drive that is more magnificent in quality which is courage so we like self-preservation but we like courage more so when someone acts more towards self-preservation and not towards courage we find them despicable because they did not go for the higher quality the, the stronger quality he goes on to say as well for a thief I can admire the bravery of a thief who steals from me, but I call him depraved because he lacks the incomparably more beautiful quality of justice. You thus admit that it is not the activity of forces which makes the depraved person depraved, but rather their inactivity. So you are bad because the greater forces are not active in you. They're not acting within you. Hmm. Strangely, he admits justice exists. 
but his idea of what that might be is devoid of purpose. Mm -hmm. That's interesting. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, 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 it's inconsistent with itself. Mm -hmm. Motives, however, are such activities. So it is incorrect to say that an act is depraved on account of its motives. Nothing of the sort. So we can't judge motive and the depravity of an action. Motives for such a deed are the only good in the act. It is only evil on account of the motive it lacks. But we could have made this proof much shorter. Would the wicked person act upon these motives if they did not guarantee him pleasure? It is pleasure alone that sets the moral being into motion. And as we know, only that which is good can provide pleasure. The Baron ag agrees to this. The good is superior to the bad. Because the Baron, he's a very innocent guy. So <laughs> he doesn't have these kind of immoral corruptions that the prince has had now with the sinister grouping of people that he's been hanging out with. And the Baron very uh, naively says, yes, pleasure is the best good. Um, and the prince continues, therefore, a person whose powers are active to a great degree will also certainly possess an excellent heart. Again, by saying more forces are active in you, you must be the best. You must be the most good. You must be the most excellent in your heart. And he cannot hate another who possesses these qualities. So lastly... This idea of moral excellence and happiness in the present. So again, he doesn't believe in immortality, right? So if you are doing good, you have to have the reward of happiness in the present, in the right now. And he goes on to say, a person's happiness merges with his moral excellence, and therefore the latter requires nothing more than no pleasure is given to him in advance of a perfection yet to be achieved. So he says this whole idea of like trying to be good and then your happiness will come way, way down the road. Do you see this in a rose that blossoms today should only become beautiful the following year? No, the rose that blossoms today is beautiful in today. that moment yeah. today. Mm -hmm. If we were equally inconceivable that the glow of the sun should present this afternoon, but the warmth only tomorrow afternoon? Uh, of course not. The glow of the sun, we receive the warmth right away. So why would it occur in a moral being, perfect and circumscribed within himself? He says self-contained. The human being is a self-contained entity of existence. This morality is a relationship completely independent of that which occurs outside of it. Our morality is independent of what occurs outside of us, and therefore we should have happiness right away, and therefore... That is why pleasure is the best good, because you get the you get the reward right away, and therefore it's the best good. Um, the Baron is unable to argue against this, but he doesn't agree with it, and he says, "Oh, good prince, you want to elevate your insensitive necessity to a position of grandeur, and you don't even wish to make a god happy with it. Wherever you find pleasure available." You find yourself a pleasure-seeking being, and yet this infinite pleasure, this feast of perfection is supposed to stand empty for eternity because it's just constantly gorging yourself in a feast, right? But like, what's the point? Where's the fulfillment? It's never. The fulfillment's always fleeting. As Sarpi said at the beginning, right? He said, we are always acquiring happiness. We have never acquired it and never will. You are always feasting, but you will never feel that feeling of satisfaction. What a horrible way to live. You never feel satisfaction. Um, so the prince says, strange, after considering for a long time, that upon which you and others found your hopes is just that which has dashed all of mine. This supposed perfection of things were everything not so self-contained, were I able to see but a single disfigured splinter jutting out of this beautiful circle, that alone were sufficient proof for me that immortality exists. Mm -hmm. So again, this idea of everything self-contained, if a circle could be proven to him to not be something self-contained by having a little splinter coming out of it, mm -hmm. uh, disfiguring it, this would be proof to him that immortality exists. And yet... He doesn't see this for some reason. Um, he says, everything I see falls back into the center. 
and the most noble thought we are capable of is merely an indispensable mechanism for driving this wheel of ephemeral reality. The Baron goes on to respond, I do not understand you, most gracious prince. Your own philosophy passes judgment upon you. You are truly like the rich man who starves surrounded by his treasure. You know, imagine being constantly hungry and never feeling full. You admit that a person contains in himself everything he needs to be happy and that he can obtain this happiness only by means of that which he possesses, but you want to seek the source of your unhappiness outside of yourself. If you are right, it is impossible for you to even wish to strive beyond the confines in which you keep mankind imprisoned. Then the prince goes on, that is the worst of it all that we are only morally perfect, only happy in order to be useful, that we enjoy our labor, but not our works. 100,000 laboring hands carried the stones to build the pyramids, but the pyramids were not their reward. The pyramids delighted the eyes of the king, and the slaves were paid off with their livelihood. What does one owe the laborer if he can labor no longer, if there is nothing for him to labor upon? Or what do you owe a person if he is no longer useful? The baron says, he will always be useful, the prince, always, even as a thinking being. Mm -hmm. um, so at this point, the, the, the baron is recounting this conversation with the prince, and the Count O remarks, I too beg forgiveness of my dear reader for having so faithfully copied the baron of F. If the excuse he had in his friend is no excuse for me, I have another excuse, and the reader will have to accept it. That is, the Baron of F could not foresee the influence which the philosophy of the prince could have upon future fate. But I know, and for that reason, I have left everything as I found it. Basically, he's saying that this philosophy of the prince sealed his doom, that he would ascend the throne in crime and he would be no longer in control of his life. I assure the reader who, hopes to, who hope to see ghosts here that some are still to come. But the reader will see for himself that they make a lot of fuss about such, disbelieve, such a disbelieving person as the prince of happens to be. So the story continues, and he basically is just deconstructed further and further to the point where he's a complete slave to his senses. He develops a gambling problem. He um, falls in love with this woman. But anyway, there's not enough time to go through with it, through all of that, although you can read the book if you if you want I, I think it's available online or um if you have problems i can probably send you um because i bought it on google like online book so i could probably send it to you so the story ends with count o writing i took the coach at once traveled night and day because he heard the prince was in a really bad shape um so he wasn't in venice all this time he he started to rush back to Venice because the prince was in trouble. Uh, I traveled night and day, and in the third week I was in Venice. My haste was no longer of any use. I had come to bring consolation to the unfortunate, to an unfortunate. I found one fortunate who no longer required my weak assistance. Baron F. lay ill and could no longer speak when I arrived. I was brought the following note from his hand. Go back where you came from, dearest O., the prince needs you no longer, nor me. His debts are paid, the cardinal reconciled, the marquis recovered. Do you remember the Armenian who distressed us so last year? In his arms you will find the prince, who has been hearing the first mass for five days. So the prince is in a Catholic mass. He was a Protestant at the beginning, knowing the overview that we just made, and that he's going to ascend his throne in crime, He's, again, just part of this pitting of Catholics versus Protestants. His court is a Protestant court, and he's going to be hurting a lot of people with his choice of Catholicism and him ascending the throne in such a way. So, so much for purpose not existing, according to the prince. He, as Hamlet, never had any control over anything that happened to him based off of how he chose to deal with things. And... That is Schiller's lesson. Yeah. Yeah.